Mark chapter 3, and we're about to do what to the rest of the world, many in the world, would be foolish. We, we open up a book that we claim is inspired by the Spirit of God. Not just the words of men, but God Himself through men has penned a book for us to open up today, to look into, and to look at one of the most foolish stories that has ever been written and to claim it is our only hope for eternal salvation. And so we stand in reverence to such foolishness. Hear the word of Christ. I'm going to read verses 20 and 21 as we begin our time together. Then he went home and the crowd gathered again. So they could not even eat. And when his family heard it, they went out to seize him. For they were saying, he is out of his mind. Oh God, we pray that we would understand the foolishness of the gospel. Because God, we in our own Sin, think we are wise. We think we are strong. And the most insane, crazy thing to do would to believe, be to believe this message of this Galilean Middle Eastern rabbi who claimed to be the Son of God, who died for our sins, came back from the dead, rules and reigns now and yet God that is the wisest thing we can be doing right now is looking to him embracing the truth that he has revealed to us and so God we ask that you would teach us by the power of your spirit according to your word what it means to be fools for Christ it's in Jesus name we pray amen May be seated. Did you hear that? I was staying overnight at one of my really good friends' house. We went to church together, and as we often did, we would stay at one another's house uh, quite often. And we were there getting ready for bed and could vaguely hear loud music and laughter and conversation and we, we, we began to understand this was coming from the woods behind his house. It was on someone else's property. And he asked me, he said, do you hear that? Everything stopped. He said, be quiet. Do you hear that? He says, those people, they are worshiping the devil back there. And I was a little kid, and a little church boy. Went to church with this kid and his family. And I thought, why in the world would someone worship the devil? What on earth are you talking about? And how on earth would someone worship the devil? And he said, yeah, my, my dad was back there the other day and he thinks he found some chicken blood on the ground in the woods. And I bet right now they're drinking that chicken blood back there. They're back there worshiping the devil. Now, when you're a small kid, you have those moments when you're at overnight at someone else's house that you want to call your parents and say, can you please come get me now? I don't want to be here. But we sat there and we began to imagine what it must be like for these people back there worshiping the devil. As we heard the sounds of quiet riot and Led Zeppelin you grew up in the 80s, you know what I'm talking about. Playing from car radios. And we began to just imagine what these people back in the woods must be doing. And we conjured all of these images up, putting things together that we had heard about what it must be like to worship Satan. And we imagined people back there in black robes and soaked in uh, blood-soaked Ouija boards playing Dungeons and Dragons and what all that must be like as we heard this music vaguely. 
And as I got older, I realized that that wasn't Satan worship per se. It may have been. Some of you may think it was. It was just a bunch of high school kids. And that's where you hung out when you were in high school. That's where you had the field parties. But we could hear that. Now, if you wanted today to know what true, genuine satanic worship is, you wouldn't have to sit around and imagine uh, what it looks like. Actually, yesterday I, I was thinking about this and I searched online the, the Church of Satan. I wouldn't recommend doing that. But they actually have a Twitter account. They have a Facebook page. They have websites. You can find all you want to know about what it means to genuinely worship Satan. But I, I, I would guess as you think about Satanic worship, demon worship, what that looks like, the images that come to your mind. You would never think about Jesus. And yet, if you ask the religious folks of his day what it looks like to worship Satan, to follow Satan, they would be immediately begin to tell you about this Middle Eastern rabbi. Who is going about claiming the kingdom of God is at hand. He is casting out demons. He is restoring the sick. He is speaking to nature and it's doing what he says. He's got this magical power and he's claiming to be the son of God. He's from Satan. That's what it looks like to serve Satan. Jesus. We would never think that way. And that's the image that would have come to the mind of the scribes and Pharisees. And we begin to see their thoughts about Jesus. The thoughts about Jesus as we begin to move through our texts. As this one who claims to be the son of God. The way people perceive that and the way that they think about that is satanic. It's foolish. Notice verse 20. Then he went home. Now, we've been talking about this mission trip that Jesus is taking with his disciples around the Sea of Galilee, how he's been going into synagogues, preaching the gospel, how he's been going from town to town to village to village, region after region, declaring that he is God's son, performing all of these signs and wonders, and a crowd is forming around him, Jew, Gentile, from all over the place, and they are following him, and here they have followed him home to Capernaum. Now, we can assume this was Peter's house. Now, remember, Peter is the one telling Mark what to write, and Peter emphasizes, yeah, Jesus' ministry headquarters was at my house. But this crowd... That he's gathered of followers has followed him back to his house. And notice they gather around the house. This happens over and over in Mark so that they could not even eat. They are crammed around the house. There's no social distancing. People are in and out of this house all of the time. There's no time to eat. There's no room to gather around the table and eat. This crowd that is mesmerized by Jesus. He is famous. This is Beatles, Michael Jackson level fame. He comes into a city. People are screaming. People want to be around him. They are following him everywhere he goes. And now they have gathered around his house. Notice his family. This would have been... Probably Mary and his cousins, brothers, friends. The term really just means close ones. Those who had known Jesus their whole life, grown up with him. They hear about this fame. They are looking in on his celebrity status. And what do they do? They go out to seize him. Literally, they go out to capture him, to stop him. This is getting out of hand, Jesus. We can't even sit down and have a meal. We can't even gather together in your home. And notice what they say. They go out to seize him for they were saying he is out of his mind. He is a fool. He is insane. He is crazy. You see, Jesus was saying things like this. If you want to go to heaven, you want to be a part of the kingdom, you must 
eat my flesh and drink my blood. You, you must, I must be your all in all. To, to follow after me, that's what it looks like. And if you heard a family member at Christmas say, I know we're eating turkey, I know we got ham, I know we got the dressing, but to get to heaven, you've got to eat my flesh and drink my blood. You're calling someone and you're getting them out of your house immediately. You need some help. That's exactly the way Jesus' family thought about him. And so they call for some help. Notice verse 22, the scribes. And these were experts in the law. And they would take the law of God that they knew so well. And they would interpret it. And they would teach traditions of the law. And if a situation like this came up. What is wrong with this man? He's claiming to be a rabbi. You call in these professionals, the experts, the corporate from Jerusalem. Come in and tell us what is going on with our family member. The, what, what is going on with this rabbi claiming to be the son of God? And he does have power. He, he's doing these amazing things. We can't deny it. We've seen it. We've seen people who could not see who can now see. We've seen people who could not walk who are up walking around. We see it. We've seen him go in the synagogue and cast out demons as he teaches so powerfully. And so we can't deny something is happening here. We need your help. This is getting out of hand. And so the scribes, corporate, the experts, the big shots from the religious headquarters, they come in with the law and they're going to try to figure out what's going on with Jesus. And notice their resp- response. He is possessed by Beelzebub. Now, this word literally means ruler of the temple. And later on, it became Lord of the flies. Now, the reason it meant Lord of the flies is because it, they referred to this God as God of dung, manure. And they referred to Satan this way. Satan is the God of dung. He is the Lord of flies. And the religious leaders say, that's what's going on here. He, he is possessed by Satan. And notice the prince of demons. That's how he's casting out demons. It, it is satanic what he is doing. As he goes about, remember he's going about from synagogue to synagogue. He's preaching in the synagogue. And we've seen throughout, where does Jesus do the most demonic warfare? Where is he casting out these demons? It's in the synagogue. And so in some sense, they're embarrassed. Y'all talking about casting out demons? Well, he's done a lot of that in our places of worship. And so how is he doing that? Where did these demons come from in our places of worship? Well, he's possessed by a demon. That's how that happens. And so they examine the situation and their ruling is, this is just your everyday demon possession. Go about your business. It's okay. Now, realize everyone would have been okay if they were just saying Jesus was a good guy. Jesus was a good teacher. I mean, think about this. Jesus was sinless. He was perfect. If you grew up around him and you knew him, you would say, that's a good guy. I mean, he was sinless. Never did anything wrong. Per se. Not per se. He never did anything wrong. And he was a good teacher. He was the word of God in flesh. And so obviously he was able to teach the word of God in an effective, powerful, compelling way. Like no one else. And so everyone would have been okay. That's a good guy. That's a good teacher. It's when people started talking about Mary's boy... This this rabbi who has no place to lay his head and he hangs out with sinners. He's the son of God. That's when everybody said, whoa. No, no, you can't say that. You're crazy to say that. There's no way that can even happen. You see, everyone was okay with saying nice things about Jesus. And here's the reality. Everyone in your life is going to be okay with you saying nice things about Jesus. They are. Jesus, if Jesus is just this safe inspiration in your life, 
And you, you claim I can do a lot of good things because of Jesus. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I can go to school. I can play sports. I can be a nice guy in the community because of Jesus. And you begin to tack Jesus onto your life as just a bullet point as you list out your morality and values. Yes, I'm a Christian. Nobody's going to have a problem with that in our culture. People are going to say, yeah, go be a good guy. That's good for you. It's just the way you grew up and you want your family to just associate with Jesus. No one's going to have a problem with that. It's when you start saying he is Lord. He is the way, the truth and the life and no one gets to heaven except through him. That's when people are going to start having problems. But either he is who he says he is or he's not. And this was the argument that many philosophers, Christian philosophers have made even C.S. Lewis one time wrote, we would sum this up as his argument that Jesus is a liar, a lunatic or Lord. When he says this, either this man was and is the son of God or else a madman or something worse. You can shut him up for a fool. You can spit at him and kill him as a demon or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. But let us not come with any patronizing nonsense about him being a great human teacher only because he has not left that open to us. He did not intend to either. He's the son of God or he's not. And if he's not the son of God, he's a liar. He's not a good guy. And if he's not the son of God, he's not a good teacher. He's a false teacher. And if he's not the son of God, he is a lunatic who cannot be trusted. And you should take your Bible and throw it in the trash can on your way out today. If Jesus isn't who he says he is, this is all stupid foolishness and we're wasting our time. There's no mushy, middle, safe place when it comes to the gospel. We claim that he was born of a virgin. It sounds like some sci-fi movie you get hung up in late at night and you can't turn off. He's born of a virgin. How does that happen? He's conceived of the Holy Spirit. We believe that to be truth. That this small town Galilean Middle Eastern rabbi was executed on a Roman cross and he came back from the dead three days later. How silly is that? It's insane. It doesn't make sense to the common mind. He walks out of a tomb and goes and sits down and eats fish. And starts talking about taking over the world with these 12 misfit disciples. And he claims to be the only way to be saved through faith in his cross and trusting in his righteousness and resurrection. And we claim when we believe that his spirit comes to live within us. And we, a bunch of weirdos, gather here today to sing about a man who's not here. We don't see him. To serve him. To pray to him, to take this message to places where it's illegal to take it to. We're a bunch of weirdos if this isn't true. We're either the most foolish people in the world, a bunch of idiots, or the most graced people on the planet. Those are the only options. There's no mushy middle ground. Our text continues, he called them to himself. Now I love this. I, I just, I stopped here this week and thought, what must this be like? Corporates in town and they're talking about Jesus and they say he's possessed by a demon and Jesus so brazenly just says, Hey guys, come here. Hey, let's have a little chat. Let, let's talk about this. You guys do realize this is a stretch. You do realize this is a grab. Y'all are smarter than that. To be honest with you, you're the fools. Because of this, he begins to talk to them in parables. Now, remember, parables means to throw alongside. He's going to explain how kingdom works, how, how, how it works. Notice he says, how can Satan cast out Satan? Do you think about what you just said? Beelzebub, really? How would that work? How does that make any sense? I'm satanic, but I'm casting out Satan. If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. If I'm of Satan, I'm toppling the kingdom of Satan. That would be stupid. You guys are smarter than this. Verse 25. 
And if a house is divided against a house, that house cannot stand. If it's just me and Satan and we're warring against one another and I'm warring against the demons, casting them out, this is all going to eventually fall. So what are y'all worried about? Why are y'all so tore up? Just let all this chaos ensue and I'll be gone one day. That's not what was going on. And that's why they were threatened. Notice verse 26. And if Satan has risen up against himself and is divided, he cannot stand but is coming to an end. If I am satanic, this is foolishness. This sort of spiritual warfare in fighting will end itself. And he begins to explain even more. Verse 27. But no one can enter a strong man's house. The ruler of a house, the master of a house and plunder his goods unless he first binds the strong man and then indeed plunder his house. And so if you're going into someone's house to take what they own. The first thing you're going to do is bind this man up and you're going to take all of his power away from him. And then you're going to take all of his goods away. He says, listen, guys. I'm not of Satan, but I have entered Satan's house and I am taking his power away to take everything he owns away. You see, the good news is Jesus has come to plunder Satan's house. Satan has made his home in the world, in the hearts of men through sin. We have followed Satan. We have submitted to his kingdom. We have entered his house by obeying his rules. He says, God doesn't love you. God doesn't want what's best for you. Trust me and do whatever you want. And through sin, Satan has invaded the world. And because of sin, we live in a world that is full of death. And so Satan right now, he has power in the world and he has influence in the world in death and chaos. And this is why even in the Bible, he's called the prince of the power of the air. And in some places, it seems as though the Bible is teaching right now, Satan is the ruler of this world. He has some limited power. He has made him his home here in our hearts, ruling over us in death. But on the cross, Jesus is bound and dies for our sin, thus taking the power of sin away from Satan. For those who believe in him, you are no longer under the power of the guilt of sin that sends you eternally to Satan's house in hell. And in dying Jesus defeats death. And the Bible says in a resurrection, he has made a spectacle of Satan. He has said to Satan, you thought in killing me, you, you, you would put an end to all this. But actually in killing me, you defeat it yourself. And he made Satan look like a fool. And having taken Satan's weapons of sin and death away, Jesus is in the world right now saying, follow me. Let's leave this house. Let's leave this house that will be plundered in a lake of fire one day. Let's go. Follow after me. Now, as the scribes heard this, this picture of the snake being plundered, their thoughts would have gone back to Egypt. When a guy named Moses showed up at Pharaoh's house to lead his people home. And before Moses led the people out of Egypt, what did he do? We see all of these signs and wonders. We see him turning the river into blood. We see flies and locusts and and frogs. and, And we see all of these signs and wonders before a Pharaoh that Moses is performing by the power of God. And Pharaoh was so humiliated when the firstborn, which is a wonder, a sign from God. The firstborn was killed in Egypt that he let the people go. And so Jesus is saying, I'm like Moses. And I have shown up at your house, you bunch of pharaohs. And you've seen me cast out demons. Guess what you've seen? More signs and wonders. Because I'm about to lead my people through a new exodus. And he stands in a new pharaoh's house. 
And in this Pharaoh's house, there would have been no pagan symbols of snakes. There would have been no graven images because they were outlawed. In this Pharaoh's house, in this satanic house of worship, there would have been scrolls with the Ten Commandments in them. That they loved, that they protected, that they taught And yet these scribes took the law of God and they oppressed the people of God. And Jesus is saying here, I'm like Moses standing before you and I am taking your power away and a cross and a resurrection in my righteousness. The power of the law that you place on people and you demand them to obey The law that will never make them free. The law that was supposed to lead them to me. I am standing before your house, you bunch of Pharaohs, saying, let my people go. I have plundered and will plunder the serpent to lead my people to freedom. You see, the synagogue was used as a weapon against Jesus. Now, I want you to think about that. The synagogue. The scribes, where they studied, where they recited the scripture, they read it, they memorized, they interpret the scripture. And here, Jesus is saying, this is Satan's house. Satan used the church to blind the people to Jesus. Now, we're in a different house today. But the same kind of warfare is happening right now. The very things that we've done today that are to lead us to Jesus for some of us are leading us away from Jesus. And you don't see it. Singing songs about the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ that we can't be good enough. That Jesus died for our sins. That he's raised from the dead. That only through trusting in his righteousness can we be saved. You sing those songs. You you articulate those things. But in doing so... You begin to think it's all about you. That in the singing and in the praying and in the doing and being smart enough to figure that out, you are saving yourself. And the very things that are called to call you to think more about Jesus are leading you away from Jesus. You know how dangerous that is? And for some of you, these things have the opposite effect. You gather in this room and you hear these songs and you hear baptism testimonies, missionary testimonies. You look around at people and you say, these people have it together. I don't even understand what they're talking about. I don't even understand the things they're saying. I, 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 I shouldn't even be here. I don't deserve to be here. And in the very place that is to lead you to Jesus, it's leading you away to Jesus. And you know why? Because Satan, apart from the Spirit of God, is a much better preacher than me. And can convince you that you're good enough without Jesus. Or can convince you today that you'll never be good enough for Jesus. You see, Satan's preaching a sermon right now too. Who are you listening to? Are you looking to Jesus as your only hope? Are you pushing all of that away and remembering Jesus was bound by the demands of the law and anything God would demand of me, he has met for me. He is my only hope. His life, his death, his resurrection, his kingdom is my only hope. He has been bound so you would not be bound today. Be free and look to him. And I know this is true. Because sometimes I'm up here and I'm preaching my guts out to try to get you to believe in Jesus. And I'll go stand at that back door and you'll be leaving. You'll say, man, you just made me feel miserable today. Oh my gosh, I'm, I got to get better at this. Man, I just, I, you made me feel so bad. Let's just go on record to say that's not what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to talk about sin so you would look to a savior. Do not be bound by Satan's power today. Look to the truth of the gospel and be free. Satan has been defeated. He has no power and guilt over you. Satan has been defeated. He has no power in death over you. Be free. Leave this Satanic house of destruction 
and follow Jesus. Notice verse 28. He says, truly, I say to you, all sins will be forgiven the children of men and whatever blasphemies they utter. Now, that's important in understanding this section of scripture because he says blasphemy will be forgiven. But notice verse 29. But whoever blasphemes the Holy Spirit. Now, the word blaspheme, it, it literally means to bore holes into To take something that is holy and good and perfect and bore holes into and pierce with curses and profanities. And he says, the children of men, anyone who blasphemes, they can be forgiven except those who blaspheme the Holy Spirit. They will never have forgiveness, but this is eternal sin and they are guilty of eternal sin. This is what leads them into eternal damnation. Now... If you've been around church or maybe thought about this before, we have all kinds of ideas of what the unpardonable sin is, what the eternal sin is. And some of us think, have I ever done that? Yeah, think back on my life. I've done a lot of bad things. Have I ever blasphemed the Holy Spirit and I'm going to hell and there's no hope for me? But but notice what's going on here. He's looking at the religious elite of the day. And he is accusing them of blasphemy. And it is of the Holy Spirit. And notice verse 30. They were saying he has an unclean spirit. And so instead of seeing what the Spirit of God is doing in Jesus. And believing he is the Son of God. Because that's what the Spirit is saying. This is the Son of God. The kingdom is at hand. They said no it's demonic. And so they are rejecting the word of the spirit that is right in front of them. And we've seen this in Mark. Remember John the Baptist. Behold, the Lamb of God is taking away the sins of the world. And Jesus comes down to be baptized. And he is raised up. And and the father says, yes, this is the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. Behold, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased. This is my king, Jesus. The father from heaven says that. And then the spirit rests upon him. And then everything that Jesus does and says... From that moment on, is done by the power of the Spirit. And so it is the Spirit that is preaching the kingdom is at hand. And it is the Spirit that is showing the kingdom is at hand. And yet these religious leaders are the ones who are rejecting it. They don't see the Holy Spirit's message right in front of them. They literally bore holes into the Word of God on a cross to display their unbelief. And so blasphemy of the Holy Spirit is to reject the Spirit's message. And this message has been given to the church. We see this in the book of Acts. The spirit rests upon the church and the church says Jesus is Lord and takes that announcement to the ends of the earth. Jesus would even say to the church, I have given you power to preach the gospel and and I've given you the keys of the kingdom and what you bind on earth will be bound and what you unbind on earth will be loosed. What he means is as you preach the gospel, you have the power in preaching the gospel to release those who believe the testimony of the spirit that you're preaching. But those who do not believe your testimony that Jesus is Lord and has died for sins and is king, they won't be forgiven. Very simply, Jesus is saying the preaching of the gospel, the testimony of the spirit to reject that is blasphemy. That's why he immediately jumps into this image at the end of our section. Mark wants to explain to us exactly what's going on here. He goes back to the family. And he says, and his mother and brothers came and they were standing outside. Now that is symbolic to what is going on. And they sent to him and they called to him. Now, again, we're back to the crowd. Mary's there. Now, I want to be clear. Mary believed the gospel. That is the Christmas story. Mary believes the gospel and declares that Jesus is her Lord and Jesus is her Savior, her son. So she believed that all along the way. We know his brothers did not believe until after the resurrection. Many in his own family did not believe, but they, they're, they're pressing into him. They, they need to talk to him. Mary is saying, why can't y'all just get along? Maybe just leave my boy alone. I know I know this is weird, it's crazy, but it's true. But there's dysfunction in Jesus' family. And here, they, they don't have backstage passes or front row seats to the Jesus show. And maybe they're frustrated about that. But notice they call to him and they say, your mother and your brother, they're outside seeking you. 
And Jesus is so offensive here. Verse 33, he said to them, who are my mother and my brothers? And they would have said, oh, you know, Mary, Mary, that's your mom. Who are you talking about? My mother and my brothers. Oh, you know, your brothers, <laughs> they're out here. Notice he says, and looking about at them who sat around him. Those who were gathered in the house, all these misfits, sick folk. The disciples who we talked about last week were just a bunch of no-name, ordinary losers. And he says, here are my mother and my brothers. My family's in the house. My family, according to flesh, can't get in the house. And it's symbolic of what he's trying to teach the scribes. It doesn't matter who you are or what you know. Notice, for whoever does the will of God, he is my brother and sister and mother. The will of God, the plan of God, the desire of God that is revealed in the kingdom of God to follow Jesus as King and Lord and submit to him. That is the will of God. And anyone who follows me as their king, that's my family. That's my family. You want to know what God's will for your life is today? We like to make that hard and difficult. God's will for your life is to follow Jesus. And so you come to those moments and you don't know what to do. Follow Jesus. Just trust him. Give your life over to him. Delight in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. That's how you determine the will of God is submit to his kingdom. Believe he died for your sins. He was raised from the dead. He is your only hope. Now we have to admit this is a cultish scene. This is weird. This is David Koresh type stuff here. Your mom and your brother and your cousin show up. At a house with a bunch of people and say, we need to talk to our son, our brother. And he says, oh, that's not my family. You're my family. And you would say, hey, honey, I know we like our BFG, but it's time to find a new place to worship. That's weird. But what's his point here? Religious flesh and blood can't get into the house. No, I've come to purge that house. Flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. But only those who are born of the spirit of God. Do you understand you can have the same DNA as Jesus and not get into his house? Do you understand you can have the same Bible as Jesus and not get into his house? That's his point. You don't get in by who you are. You don't get in by what you've done. And here Mark is painted a picture for us, beginning back with Judas, the one who betrayed him, that the blasphemers are actually a disciple, flesh and blood family, and the good religious guys. In the story of Jesus, those are who have blasphemed him. Judas, who we saw last week, had the same power and authority that the other disciples had, but he betrayed him. His family, who knows him, they grew up with him. Can you imagine what Christmas was like at Mary's house? I'm going to tell you all the Christmas story. They heard it their whole life. And they get to this point, they say, oh, this is getting ridiculous. He's He's crazy. The religious, he is a demon. They were reading scriptures about him. He's demonic. They saw firsthand what the Spirit was saying in his person and rejected it. They were the blasphemers. He came to his own and his own did not receive him. You see, blasphemy looks way less satanic than we think. Blasphemy and Satan worship doesn't always include a Marilyn Manson CD and bloody bad heads. No blasphemy can look like hanging out with Jesus but not following Jesus. Blasphemy can look like teaching Jesus but not believing in Jesus. Blasphemy can look like a lot of good things but not believing what the Spirit is saying right in front of you and bowing down and following Jesus as King. And so as we sit around and we think about what satanic worship must look like. It's not just the folks out in the field behind your house. So often it's the folks in your house. 
So often it's the scribe in the mirror of the house Jesus has come to plunder. And blasphemy would be for you today to hear what the Spirit is saying to you. Some of you have gone to church your whole life. You know more about the Bible than anybody here. You could preach this sermon better than me. You've gone to church your whole life and you've heard the Spirit's message your whole life. And you're saying right now, I don't know if I've ever believed that message. I don't, I've been playing a game. This was just about this cultural thing that I had to be a part of. And I showed up at church every week and it was cool to be around these people. And right now the Spirit is saying something to your life that you've never followed Jesus. And you know what would be satanic in this moment? Is you to turn around and walk away. And say no, 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 no. If I, if I say... I never believed the gospel. These people are going to think I'm weird. They're going to look at me and say, are you sure you lead my BFG? I was looking at Sam. I think Sam's a Christian. He leads my BFG. I wasn't talking about him. Do you see how that looks? Hey, you, you, you teach my children about Jesus in Ashland Kids. And now you're saying you never believe the message that you teach them? That would be satanic today. For you to embrace that pride. That would be satanic for you to not follow Jesus. And then there are some of us here today and you're saying, Oh my word, I have sinned so much. I'm sure blasphemy is in there somewhere. I, I have forgotten more sin then everybody in here will commit. And I'm sure at some point I have blasphemed the Holy Spirit. Well, for you, blasphemy blasphemy of the Spirit isn't something that you've already done. It's something that you may do right now in rejecting what the Spirit is saying to you. In believing that you can't be forgiven of everything you've done. That would be satanic. See, blasphemy doesn't involve chicken blood or Ouija boards. Blasphemy is a hard heart full of religion. Blasphemy is a hard heart full of pride that says, I'm not good enough for Jesus. And the Spirit says, oh, believe in Him. He's been good enough for you.